welcome everybody thank you for joining me on my session big shout out to the sponsors uh please pay these companies a visit because obviously events like this can't run without these companies and the brilliant volunteers that run these events um so make sure you visit all these sponsors if you can virtually a uh, quick um very quick overview of my session. So really this session aims to condense lots of the subject material that I've talked about over the years. And you could really summarize the session as it's about transaction processing. Um, so I, what I would say, if you're an absolute guru in this area, you might not learn anything new. Um, but if it's some, if SQL Server performance has um, always eluded you or you found various things confusing, then hopefully this session will address some of those problems. Um, I, I should also make sure that you are understanding of the fact that this session is more along the lines of a, a DBA and developer style performance. We're not talking about designing a system um, from an architectural pers perspective so we're not talking about uh, buying buying loads of servers and having you know scale out through uh, re readable replicas for availability groups so it's not that kind of session where we are focused more along the lines of development um, and dba tweaks if that lot appeals to you, then a very, very quick little bit about myself. All that's important are the contact details, which you will get at the end. So don't worry too much about that now. Um, but um, why am I qualified to talk about this subject? Well, some people might say that I'm not, but I have worked as a tech editor or reviewer on a few books, um, one of which is um, what I think is currently one of the best books on the market on this subject called Expert SQL Server Transactions and Locking by Dmitry Korotkevich. I can always, I can never say his name, Korotkevich. I think is his proper pronunciation um, and one which is due out at the start of next year. Um, I've been advised it's early 2021 um, is one called High Performance SQL Server Second Edition by Benjamin Navarez. And that's um, that that sort of covers much more detail in terms of, um, uh, you know, using um various trace flags and, and lots more um, detail across the board on SQL Server rather than just being focused in one area right like Dimitri's book. Dimitri's book is brilliant at what it does and um, so is Benjamin's. Anyhow, enough rambling from me. Moving straight, straight to uh, my agenda today. So first thing we're going to touch upon is my approach to query tuning and indexing. Um, it's something I've always struggled with over the years as a as a DBA and developer. Um, we're also going to talk about um, isolation and and locking, one of my favourite topics. And we are going to cover some of the mechanics in SQL Server. Actually, how SQL Server works behind the scenes is important for you guys to understand um, in order to know what you need not to do. And finally, we are going to touch upon some improvements. It's also important for me to to say that um, that I normally overrun with this session and I'm co quite conscious that I don't want to do that today, even though I've, I'm told we do have a little bit of extra time at the end. Um, so I will skip over some of the materials, uh, but it will all be available for you from my GitHub repo, which I'll give you at the end, including all the slides as well. So if that appeals, then please continue with me. If not, then jump over to another amazing session elsewhere. So I like to explain what exactly it is we're doing here. What, what is speed concurrency and correctness? Because I think these terms are often misinterpreted. Speed, you can really think of, of how quickly does a query run at or how quickly can it run at? This is basically how quickly it runs in isolation. So you, you see here, we've got a single car on the, on the track. How quickly can this car go around the track without anything else getting in the way? We don't want any any um, uh, wheels falling onto the road to, to block the car. We literally have a clear track and then how quickly the car goes around on the track is what we're concerned about. One excellent method I found in order to really understand the speed of your system. We'll talk about this a little bit later when we talk about cost, query cost, um, is to run a single really the basic query in isolation on a system to understand how quickly the quickest query 
could run given that all your indexing is is completely uh, perfect but i'll talk about that a little bit more later the next thing we move on to is concurrency so we've got this single query that we run in isolation but what happens when we start adding this query into an existing load on the server does everything suddenly start to slow down concurrency is really about how much we can do at the same time without affecting other, other loads if a system is known as highly concurrent then clearly we can do um, a lot of queries on the system at the same time so obviously in any system we're going to get um, various contention for physical resources and logical resources such as uh, uh, pages in, in in memory or or rows um, and many uh, many other things and this is where a system starts to slow down obviously we have other logical constructs in SQL server such as uh, locks which will then cause blocking which will also slow down the system so all these things um, go together to uh, make a system either very concurrent or not very concurrent and this is your job to try and overcome these problems and then finally often this topic is is kind of ignored by developers dbas and absolutely anyone that's using the data database system um, it's con correctness and um really what we understand by correctness and there, uh, there are different meanings of what this 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 is but the the meaning that that i really use is that when we perform an action on our server we want that action to do exactly what we expected it to do so for example if we were if we expected to insert a row into a system we expect that row to be in the system and you know that the data to be there or if we update a row we expect that update to have happened um, so you can think of that a bit like this car park scenario so if we're running in serializable isolation where cars were going into the car park think of those as being transactions one after the other and we gave every driver instructions to park in a certain place when we go to a concurrent system, so we run things at, at um, the same time, we would expect the same order and values. What we wouldn't expect to see is half a car or an engine being in a certain place or missing wheels, okay? So that's kind of what we mean by correctness. And I'm gonna show you some worrying things there um, in SQL Server. Now, my approach to uh, query uh, troubleshooting I, I confess that when I pick up other people's code this is a big problem to me because generally either I'm not clever enough or the person that's written the query is too stupid to have written a good query uh, whichever the explanation is is I really struggle when I take someone's query to really understand what they were trying to do if it's certainly if it's a complex query and I found over the years that the best way to troubleshoot query performance is to assume that they've written a, a a query which is accurate and describes exactly what they want to do and in the right manner and i will simply look at what it's doing behind the scenes how is sql server interpreting that query and um trying to um create the plan and do all these actions so what we what we need to do is we look at the query plan and this is this is how i approach this and i do these things in this order the first thing i will do is look at the actual query cost so um the way that you get query cost is let me just see if i can get the laser pointer up is if we do a properties on the root um root node here the select then you will see the cost listed and um this is really an abstract figure i won't go into the uh, big story of why this figure came about what cause, but the cost is just abstract and it only has meaning when you compare it to other things but how big should your cost be so the best way to find this out is if you go back to the example i mentioned earlier about running the simplest query that you could possibly run um and you, you know it's doing the most efficient seek then uh then you know that to return that one row assuming you have only touched one row then that is the optimal cost you'll never get anything better than that so you should always be aiming for that cost obviously in a situation where you're returning 10 billion rows you know your cost is going to be a lot larger um, in in those cases where we are returning or uh, more than just one thing and having to do more complicated uh, uh, uh query plans and then than a simple one then that's where we start to look at these things so 
you'd first look at your query cost and just understand is this cost abnormal for what for the number of rows that we're actually returning from SQL Server and what's actually happening. Now, um, one little tip I, I have here is to, if in fact, I'll talk about this later, so bear with me on that, sorry. Let's just talk about the, the, the memory grant. The memory grant is a, an amount of memory that the query optimizer or the query engine assigns to, uh, to basically process a query. Now, this is the memory grant is based upon estimations um, that, that are gained from your statistics in SQL Server of your data. And these can be wildly inaccurate or they can be exact. Now, uh, SQL Server will take a memory grant. And if the memory grant's not big enough to process your query, then obviously we start getting spilling to disk behind the scenes and your, um, your system will slow down. So the memory grant is very, very important also to understand um, with your query, especially on the basis. It, it, I've had a scenario where I had two queries that where the plan was exact, the query was exact apart from the predicate, yet um, they were, one was really, really slow and one was quick. And the answer was that the statistics, statistics um, basically gave the impression that for one of the predicates, there weren't that many rows. So the plan was wildly inaccurate for, um, for what we were doing, which um, so obviously for that specific query, we got lots of spilling behind the scenes. So this next thing that I do, and this is probably one of the most important thing techniques I found, is look at what outputs we have from our operators against what goes into them. And uh, let me give you a good scenario here. So uh, I'm looking at, we've got 8,511 uh, rows being outputted from this hash match operator, yet the inputs are 55,000. Here. And you can see that we've got a lovely big thick line. So thick lines are also something good to look for as well. So automatically, my attention's going to go to here. Can I do something about this? And I'll talk about that in a second. And down here, we've got 3,918 rows. But um, again, that is less than that. But that will obviously still be under consideration because we'll treat everything, all the child operators as, um, as a whole underneath there. So moving swiftly on, the next thing, and this is probably the first thing that you would initially look at, is, is I look at problem operators. There are common operators which are uh, definitely problems. Classic one is the key lookup or bookmark lookup um, or read lookup, I think it's called now, um, which we know is definitely something that we, we need to address. And that basically means that the, the indexes that are being used at the moment do not fully cover your query. So we may be accessing a row in the table which isn't covered at all by the index and therefore we have to do a lookup in our clustered index. Um, in this case it's a clustered index lookup and uh, to get those extra values. So that we, that's a definite thing that we need to troubleshoot. Now, scans are also a classic. You see here, we are already looking over here as a potential problem. This would be the very first thing I look at because if we're returning 55,000 rows and we're doing a clustered index scan, um, this would be a big problem to me. Notice though that the costs are also a clue of where problems lie as well. So don't just solely rely on, on these values. Um, but this is a good rule of thumb to start in, in these areas. Um, and uh, joins as well. Joins are a bit misleading, I find, because the uh, often hash matches are commonly thought as not necessarily a good thing. Uh, but the, the, the match is generally indicative of what the inputs are. So if we had, let's say, a really small input here and a, uh, a a relatively small input here or even a, a, a largest input, it is likely that we may get a nested loops join, which is considered to be a bit more performant than a than a hash match. Uh, we can also look at things like sorts. Sorts mean that the data that's being returned is not in the order we need it for for the next operator down. So perhaps perhaps what we need here is a, an index that is is 
in the order we need using the key columns that we need and that will eventually hopefully if you do your job correctly resolve all of this segment and we will then move on to this index scan and hopefully we'll have a very highly efficient query um, something that generally gets me quite a lot is is predicate logic so so I've often tried to troubleshoot plans for ages, not really by looking at the query, but just by looking at the plan. Problem with that is sometimes the query logic might have um, uh, things such as or statements, which is essentially duplicating the operations. And um, often they're very difficult to troubleshoot uh, on the basis you can't really remove that duplicate operation. But what you can do is make, make each of those operations much more performant. And that's kind of how you tackle that. So don't try and waste time on thinking, oh, this is a duplicate um, graphically, this is a duplicate uh, operation to this operation. It may, it's almost certainly needed for a reason, and it, it will be down to the logic. And another thing that has caught me in the past is joins or filters on different predicate types. Uh, you get this problem with implicit conversion. So um, some idiot may have created a table with different data types in. Let's just say he's, he's created a, a, a var char for a numerical column and in your other table, you have, it's actually been defined as a numerical uh, column and you need to do a join between that. Now, the problem is SQL Server has various rules for implicit conversion. If it goes the wrong way around, then it will have to scan the uh, largest table first, if you're unlucky, um, in order to pull all that data out to convert it into the right type to then do the comparison. The small table would obviously, um, in that scenario, be the data would be able to be seeked. Okay, um, so bear that one in mind. This is one of the reasons why we always want to keep the types the same. Um, I'll try not to um, spend too much time on indexing and, uh, because we're going to burn a lot of time here talking about some of these fundamentals, um, but I think it's important to understand indexing. Um, so, so what we have here is the um, architecture of the way that clustered indexes and non-clustered indexes work. Now, in Benjamin's book, he basically describes clustered indexes um, that you should keep them unique narrow, static, and ever-increasing. This, this ever-increasing thing I'll talk about in a second. Um, generally, our clustered indexes are good for range scans uh, because obviously we have a logical order applied to our leaf data. So a clustered index is the table, essentially, or at least the leaf of it is, and then we have our index pages above. When you define, define index columns, then um, these index columns are the only thing that will appear in these in the pages along with the cluster key. Sorry, the cluster key is the only thing that appears in these pages. Um, this is an important, important point to note because uh, we need the cluster key uh, when we define our non-clustered index, or at least the engine does, because in our index pages and our leaf pages of our non-clustered index, our clustered key will also appear there. Um, so the larger your clustered key, the more space you're going to consume within your non-clustered index. So you always want to keep your cluster key small. Um, moving on swiftly. So I've already said this, that the number of key columns that you use will determine the amount of space used in your index pages. And in the case of non-clustered index, your leaf pages too. Now, um, there is a, a thing with beginners in SQL Server where uh, if your query is not satisfying, so if you're returning, um, let's say, uh, first name, surname, where ID equals MB, for instance, problem is if your index does not provide uh, um, the values for first name and surname, then you will do your lookup. So there is a common mistake that people make by adding those extra values in your in, in your index key. This in situations where it's not a search predicate, there is absolutely no reason to add those values in your index key. What you want to do is put them as include columns in your non-clustered index. OK, 
okay so and the reason that's a good thing is one your um key is is smaller so you lose less space and the second thing is is the um the the those included columns will only appear within your leaf pages of your non-clustered index now clustered index is always considered to be covering because as i said the table the clustered index is the table so all the data is contained within your leaf pages so you'll never have a a key lookup problem um, if you're querying a clustered index and I've already stated about the key present there. And um, there's there's one consideration here, which is why I was uh, questioning the ever increasing statement that we have. And that's generally correct, but we have a situation in really concurrent systems whereby, um, or really active systems, if we have many, many queries trying to insert uh, records at the same time to the same table, you have a problem in the ever increasing scenario that the same leaf page will be accessed to do that insert and therefore you start to get um, page contention page weights and um, the the only real way around that is to consider using a different cluster uh, cluster key which is not ever increasing this is really there's not a right or a wrong answer here of what you do you really just have to understand your access patterns for your for your tables but uh, best thing to do is follow the general rule of thumb and then consider what you are doing um, as as edge cases or or differences from there just quickly uh, going over again what we've we've just discussed so what we want to do is limit the amount of columns we specify in our query because that will mean that there's more chance that our index will be covering and we can avoid lookups um, so um, what what might not be obvious to beginners as well is that indexes add extra overhead to the server because the engine has to keep maintaining these indexes as we change or insert data so do not add a million indexes keep your indexes to a minimum only put there what you really need to put and when you do have situations where you might have the occasional query that, that causes a lookup understand how often you, that's going to run in the system and whether it's really worth changing an index and adding uh, an include to um, you know to overcome those things because you'll end up just putting the entire table columns within a index somehow and um, i've already said this about keeping the number of index uh, key columns small especially in the case of your cluster index key the larger that is the more space you're gonna consume across all your indexes that is a, a you know really important point but your cluster index key needs to be highly sizable so you're really aiming for the uh, for the situation where if I do a search and I have all the index key values and I'm going to pull back one row that would be the ideal scenario when you have indexes, this will also create a statistics object, but it's also important to understand that um, if you have missing indexes, SQL Server will auto generate temporary stats. A little tip that I've used in the past is I'll actually look and see if there are any temp stats there that will give me an indication of maybe SQL Server is doing something behind the scenes where it needs these stats. Maybe there's a missing index. And another common misconception here is that um, if you take your index key, you have to, uh, it's only useful to search um, from the prefix onward. You can't search from the postfix. So my boss once said to me, he wanted me to search this humongous table. All we knew is we wanted everything that ended with ARK. And I said to him, it wasn't possible because we'd have to scan the entire an entire table to do that so we could of course have done the m wildcard if we were searching for mark or anything beginning with m uh, mark martin whatever uh, but we can't do it the other way around so this is something that you you also need to understand this is why a scan might also happen and um finally this is maybe not so obvious but calculated predicates um will almost certainly scan. So if you think about a scenario where we've got a where clause, where what we want to say is, if we've got sales times quantity, if it's less than a hundred pounds, so orders less than a hundred pounds, uh, we want to return all of those for whatever reason. 
SQL Server, it doesn't know what's going to be less than 100 until it's actually done the join and queried both values and then done the multiplication. So what you're going to end up having is, is scans happening when you might not think that that would happen. Let's go to the very first um, uh, exercise here. I'll tell you guys and girls that um, you can all run this stuff yourself. I'll, you, you simply just run this setup file, but you may have to change some paths here. You'll see I'm, I'm doing this here and then just run setup and then that will set you up. And I'm hoping I've done this properly because otherwise we're going to have a long wait. And and then uh, let's open the first example. So what we have here is a very, very simple query. We're going to search for an ID equal to um, 50999. Is this fast enough? And of course, the answer is, yeah, of course it is. That one ran really quickly. Two milliseconds, that is amazing. All right, so I've told my senior DBA I'm, I'm happy with things. My senior DBA still isn't happy um, for whatever reason. So what we're going to do is I'm going to just um, include the actual execution plan and run this query again. First thing I'm going to do is look at um, our statistics. And this is really odd. Me as a junior DBA, I can see that we've got 232 logical reads. Don't really understand why that's happening because we're simply returning one row. But if we look at the execution plan, I know you all knew this was coming. We're doing a table scan. So, but at the end of the day, it's only two milliseconds. Is this really a problem? So don't forget the access patterns for selects will be exactly the same for searching for data for updates. So what we're doing here in this query is pretty much doing the similar type of query where we're gonna go for a random value in the table and we're gonna essentially update the batch ID to what it currently is um, using the same kind of search predicate here. So if I now load up a tool called SQL Query Stress, I'm going to run 100 iterations under 10 threads. That means we're going to get um, parallelism going on on our server now. And what we will see is an effect of concurrency because now, because we're accessing, doing table scans each time, we have a cumulative effect of things going wrong here on the server. So this is going to be about 20 seconds, hopefully. So is there anything we can do? Well, of course, we know that we're missing a clustered index. Um, well, you would if you investigated it properly. And um, clearly, we do not have an index for that search predicate. So I'm going to create a clustered index here. And I'm going to go back and run this query again. So I don't know if people want to guess what we're going to get. Um, it might be 20 seconds again, or it might be quicker. And on a production system, you would actually expect an even bigger increase than that. But this is the effect of, of concurrent loads on a server. The smallest insignificant query um, might still need to be optimized. So you really need to bear in mind of how many times that query is executing in how, uh, how much of a you know, time space. And just to sort of really labor this point, um, we can see we're getting our efficient seek here and we're accessing two uh, logical pages. That's, of course, the index um, uh, it, index pages itself and the leaf pages of the clustered index. OK, so uh, I've got a couple of presenters notes here. The first is just to really understand your indexing strategy and um, really think about about your data access patterns. Um, it, it's really important because, as I've just shown you, insignificant queries could be the worst 
worst hitters on your on your system and um i i've i've kind of come up with this this phrase that a query is fast enough if it accesses the minimum amount of pages possible in order to satisfy the result set so in this case we know for a fact that the index um in question only has one index page and one uh, data page and therefore uh, therefore two is is the least amount to satisfy that requirement and okay so that's that demo out of the way moving swiftly back to our session i won't spend too much time on this because this this is a isolation uh, levels is something that is talked about a lot at conferences i just want to tell you that i've colored the levels in the way that i think they are the best you may be surprised to learn that i've colored read uncommitted as being the worst one because you get the worst level of um the worst level of uh, con uh, of um, correctness that you can possibly get because you get dirty reads happening um, and the second is that they still don't solve a problem which is the write write dependencies so if you've got two transactions that are trying to write to the same resource at the same time you're obviously still going to get blocking so um, read uncommitted you're in my opinion you're getting the worst of both worlds albeit you are querying data that which may or may not be right um, quickly um, as long as it are reads. The uh, next second worst is the serializable isolation. And um, the reason that is the second worst is you are not getting that dirty read behavior, um, but you're obviously getting loads of deadlocks because it's trying to honor, honor the serializable isolation and it will, um, uh, be over um, gregarious about how many locks or the duration of the locks it takes out. So try and avoid try and avoid those. The two that's in green, interestingly, are the on disk uh, isolation optimistic isolation levels. Bear in mind that the on disk disk optimistic isolation levels both still have write write dependencies. The reason I think snapshot is slightly better than read committed is that um, you don't have any bad dependencies, but um, but the reason they're the same color is read committed with snapshot is the only one we can make a alternative default to read committed in in SQL Server. Bottom line is, is go to optimistic isolation every time. Quick review of what we've just discussed. So isolation levels are really there to provide a balance between consistency and correctness. If you really have to have correctness perfect, um, then you could argue that serializable is, is the way to go. But from a performance angle, it's definitely not. Um, so the alternative there would be snapshot. Um, but but to, uh, bear, a bearable isolation level is recommitted snapshot isolation. So these isolations can be uh, levels can be set at session level, transaction level, and even via hints at statement level. I've already said that read committed um, isolation and read committed snapshot isolation are the only ones that you can set by default. Um, and these are the on disk. Uh, versions. Otherwise, you're going to have to explicitly specify them in code. Uh, we've already talked about that um, all of the on disk pessimistic and optimistic isolation levels still block on writes. But in memory, uh, which uses optimistic isolation, that is functionally better than any of those because we do not block on writes either for that. So if you can go to on memory, especially for um, OLTP systems, then obviously that's something you need to seriously consider. Quick locking review. Locks are only really memory structures. OK, they, they, they uh, when you have a lock, it's a logical lock block and they can consume a lot of memory. So what you want to avoid is your SQL uh, database engine or the lock manager escalating all your locks to a higher level lock which will then uh, and it does this to save memory um, because um, that will then cause serious locking problems when you start to get escalation we'll see that in a second 
You should only explicitly use table locks um, when you're doing operations such as bulk loading or reporting. And I've already said no lock is prone to failures um, and for long running queries, especially that 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 tends to go wrong. Um, you also have the problem with data, dirty reads. So please avoid it and instead use snapshot isolation or recommitted snapshots. And a uh, very, very important point to know is depending on what isolation level you're using, the lock duration, the time that your locks are taken against a resource will vary. So for the higher level isolation levels like snapshot, um, sorry, not snapshot, uh, serializable, then your read locks are uh, held until the end of your, your transaction, as are your read locks. So uh, as are your, re your read and write locks are held to the end of the transaction, sorry. Whereas in the default read committed, your read locks are just taken against a resource when you're reading it and then released within the transaction straight away. Going swiftly on to the next uh, demo, if I can open it up. So what we have is we have two sessions here. And in the first session, what I want to show you is a consistency problem um, here. And this is a real strange ed edge case that happens in SQL Server. So I'm just going to explain it. What we're going to do here is we've got a transaction and we're going to insert 10 records into a table. And there's only going to be ever going to be 10 records in that table. And we've got a slight weight here to try and make this problem even, even worse. And we're going to run this on a loop. OK, so it's deleting everything, inserting everything. It's within the transaction. So this operation occurs in an all or nothing fashion. On the other side, very, very similar bit of code. Uh, we're going to insert, we're going to basically within uh, this bit of code, we're going to delete everything from our cars variable. We're going to insert everything into the cars table variable from the cars table. And if we get to a scenario where the row, number of rows that we've inserted is less than 10, then we're going to break, which if you think about it, should never happen because we'll either be blocked trying to access the rows in that table or we'll get 10 because a transaction is exactly that. It's an all or nothing operation, or at least it's supposed to be. All right, so just going to quickly run this. And strangely, we've only had one successful run. And then on the second run, we've only queried nine records. Um, OK, so that's a bit weird. Let's do it again. This time, we didn't get any successful prior runs. And we've only got eight records. And so on. Now, I have had situations where I've got 20 or 80 successful runs. So this is a very inconsistent um, demo. And it would vary on your system. Now, the this is a real edge case problem, and let's just see if we can resolve it. But if you are interested, Paul Randall talks about, he kind of alludes to what he thinks um, uh, it's a similar problem, but it's not the exact one. So I've taken from what he says that it's basically happening because the way SQL Server accesses mixed extents, one extra reason not to use mixed extents. So let's try and avoid um, this consistency problem. So we're going to run under serializable isolation level. And as I'm sure you're all going to guess, what actually happens, it fixes the problem, but now we're getting lots of deadlock. So we now have consistency. All right, so that's not great. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to transition to recommitted snapshot and see whether this fixes our consistency problem. Now, because we've done that, we're going to have to rerun this code if we're able. And then let's run again under that our new read committed snapshot isolation default. And as you will probably see, if I sit here for half an hour, um, we've fixed the problem, but I'm not going to bore you to death waiting for that. So <laughs> just, uh, yeah, I mean, you can try this at home. Just assume that I, it, we have fixed it. So just out of morbid curiosity, does Snapshot fix the problem? 
and of course yes it does and again i won't uh, let you have to wait for half an hour to prove me right so this is another reason why you need to go to optimistic isolation levels cool and let me just oh okay so let's go back here let's try and roll back any transactions so i also want to demonstrate an atomicity problem our all or nothing scenario um, that i've talked about now what we're going to do is we're going to create a simple table called t1 And the next thing we're going to do is going to do an open-ended transaction. So you see we've inserted one record with a value of one. We're going to update within the transaction uh, T1. We're going to set that col uh, column value to three where it equals one, since that's the only row uh, uh, value in, in there for that one row. Um, it's fine. So we've got an open-ended transaction. Now, in a, another session, what we're going to do is we're going to set what's known as a lock timeout. So if we're trying to get a concurrent system and decide to use this so that when SQL Server or our application hits a, a, a lock, what we're going to want it to do is just to, to um, basically time out and then we'll get be able to um, retry the transaction within our application. This is something I've seen in the real world. So let's just try this. So within this transaction, you'll see what I'm going to try and do is insert a value into that table. Um, so that's a value of two. But I'm also going to try to delete uh, a row out of there where C1 equals one. Bear in mind, this is a thing that's currently being changed. Therefore, we expect to get a block. And because we've set a lock timeout, we expect the thing to um, roll back. So you see there, we did hit the lock request timeout period. And uh, let's just double check that we've got no open transactions. We haven't. So as a application developer, I now think we roll back and I'll implement this code and we're all good to go. The only problem is, is if we now commit this change and select from that table, you'll see we actually managed to insert uh, the the other record in this statement, this one. So rather than getting a roll back, we just caused the transaction to commit, but this statement to fail. And there are lots of examples of, of um, scenarios where this will happen in SQL Server. And the only real way around it is to use proper error, error handling in your code and to basically do explicit rollbacks in your code. Something to really watch out for because um, I, as I say many times in these sessions, um, SQL Server does not by default provide atomicity in its transaction management um, if you're not using the right code. So let's now, um, I think, okay, so let's move quickly on to demo three. So what we have here, I'm going to be talking about escalation here. Now, most of you may know that as I've written here, I'll just zoom in a little bit. Um, the escalation will generally occur when more than 5,000 locks are being taken out. Let me just explain to you how this is really working. So again, let's run this piece of code and look at our open locks. Um, there is nothing, nothing of, of any concern here within our table. Um, and you'll see here um, a, a portion of our table. We've done a top three, okay? So we've got 50,999 rows in this table. What we're going to do is we've got a transaction and we're going to update um, table one where the batch ID is less than 1,000. So that's 999 uh, key locks that we would expect to, to happen. So we've got to session two and just query that. And you'll see 
that we had those existing locks and plus 999 we've got exactly what we expected here that's fine okay we expected this behavior still within a, the same transaction so i am now going to update less than 5000 so 4999 but if you remember we've got the 999 as well so that's greater than 5000 so me being quite stupid i would expect escalation to now happen and because i'm talking about this you know what's coming and of course 6042 so this I've written about this in my in my blog. Um, this is one of those things you need to be very, very careful about, because if your code is uh, essentially taking out locks on separate statements within the transaction, you will just get a cumulative amount of those, lock, those locks. I've not found an upper limit yet. I suspect you could basically kill your SQL server uh, and run out of memory by doing by doing this, although I've not actually tried. Please don't do it in production. Um, so why does escalation actually happen? And the bottom line is, is you need to update it for any one statement within a transaction over 5,000 records. So we're going to do that here. I think there's about 6,000 we're updating there in one go. So 6,000 rows affected plus all the other ones. And this time, because it was 6,000, we have now escalated to a single table lock which is an exclusive lock of course because we're doing changes is this really a bad thing escalation well from a concurrency perspective it's a terrible thing because if we do a quick query you will note that we're just going to block whilst that transaction is open so let's just roll that back and blocking should be removed and now we can query our table Okay, I'm just going to do a quick time check. So I think I've got um, another 10 minutes or so before we open up for questions. Um, okay, back to the slides. Now, uh, this is where we're going to talk about how SQL Server does stuff, because I think it's quite important to understand that SQL Server, um, even taking in memory OLTP out of the equation, always tries to does, do stuff in memory. This is why we have this thing called the buffer cache. Even from a log file perspective, um, we have a, a log buffers over here, which I'll talk about in a second. So we've got a single statement here, which is um, updating a single row. It's a uh, implicit transaction here. So um, it's doing an auto or sorry, an auto commit con transaction and um, and basically updating that row. And that's fine. OK, this was the value is changed into into uh, memory pages and that's it. However, should our select statement try and query that row at the time this is being changed, then it will clearly block until the commit has happened. But it'll be very, very quick, of course. Nothing has been written down to the data file until we get a checkpoint happening. And these are periodic in SQL Server. Now, when we start to get more complex transactions, um, we're updating a couple of values here. And uh, what's important to note here that these changes are being um, uh, put into our log buffers, but the log buffer is entirely in memory and is not flushed to our log file until our commit happens. The only way around that to, to get it to change is to, um, to move to delayed durability, but there are uh, consistency concerns that you need to be aware of if you do do that. So please go and look that up. On the right hand side, it's important also to understand if you are using in memory, then you are still using the same logging uh, construct. So your log file is always going to be your number one bottleneck if everything else has been addressed in your system. Um, your, 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 Log records, though, are highly, um, highly compressed. Um, so this is a, a, you know, you will definitely odd offload uh, your log file usage when you use in memory. Um, and it does this clever thing with checkpoint file pairs, um, writing down your data, data changes. And this is all asynchronous. 
all we, and this is what it, the construct it uses to um, persist your persist your data. Up here, um, what you're really concerned about as a as an end user to your system is that all your table and changes to your table are happening in memory. So because we have this asynchronous construct going on here to persist the data, we've still got full logging going on, um, but we've got this highly efficient in-memory um, set of rows and row versions. We, this is how in-memory is able to be so quick. So very, very quick review of what we've discussed. Uh, because we're talking about SQL Server utilizing as much memory as possible to do its caching of the, of the log and um, your, your data cache, you really have to be careful of not doing large reads or writes in your system because you will ultimately flush your buffer cache out. And um, you know you, you can quite easily do a demonstration of this yourself and, and, uh, and see your page life expectancy just tank when you, when you do those things. And you also need to get your memory reservations to exactly the right level. All right, I'm not going to go into too much detail about that, but bear in mind when you're doing table scans, one of the reasons we are trying to improve our indexing strategy is we're trying to not touch uh, any data we don't need to touch because, again, that will uh, inherently flush out data that we don't want to flush out um, for reasons that we could avoid. Already talked about transaction log being the key bottleneck. Um, reducing overhead is possible via in memory OLTP. Delayed durability. Um, Please look it up, but it's a very useful technology to, to use to implement concurrency in systems where you may not be bothered if you have a system failure and that you lose data. If you can replay that data, then it's definitely something you should look at to try and solve your uh, transaction log bottlenecks. And moving on to, to scheduling in SQL Server, this is probably one of the techniques that I find most useful to troubleshoot my SQL Server performance. I just wanted to explain how, for one logical uh, scheduler in SQL Server, it maps onto a, a logical CPU core, uh, how, the, how, how things work for scheduling queries. Obviously, you'll have more than one scheduler. So a query, when it goes parallel, we use multiple um, schedulers um, for that same query. Now, what we have is we have, if a query you run, um, it has no resource weights, it will uh, be put onto the runnable queue. When the um, uh, scheduler is free, that SPID, that query, will be placed onto the uh, as a runnable task for the scheduler and obviously be executed. Now, what will happen is SQL Server will continue to run this task, run the query, but SQL Server, uh, when it hits um, any uh, resource contention so if there's a resource wait we, we need to wait um on a resource it could be a um could be a, a like we're waiting to write to disk because something else is going on or it could be any it could be lots of different reasons then when we hit a resource wait this SPID will then be placed back onto the waiter list and this is how SQL Server cooperatively goes through all the queries and try and runs thing things as, as in parallel as, as as much as possible obviously we have more than one scheduler here as, as well to do parallel queries and uh, does this in a cooperative manner now there is one sort of um, exception to this and that's if this we've got a very long query and we're not ever hitting any resource weights, then we also have a quantum on that uh, runnable task. And if we're, our quantum gets exhausted, then our SPID will get placed straight onto the runnable queue. Uh, the reason that SQL Server does that, of course, is that you don't want a really long query just completely taking over your scheduler. The important point that I'm trying to get to here is that Whenever these uh, tasks are moving across these various things, these are all recorded in this lovely DMV, uh, sys.dmv underscore OS underscore waiting underscore tasks. This is a really, really useful DMV for you to query any queries that are waiting on any resources. But even just as more, uh, uh, just as important, um, some may, might argue more so, is that uh, SQL Server records what exactly 
the SPID was waiting for, the resource weights that we were waiting on, and you can query them, I'm sure most of you will be familiar with this um, from this DMV. But I'm not going to go into any more detail on that. That's how scheduling works. Um, I've kept this slide in the deck just for your reference. I'll let you look at this for homework. And there is one other demo which we don't have time for. So I will let, um, in fact, demos four and five are your homework too. So please download that. So what we want to do now is just summarize what we've talked about. First thing you need to do is try and keep your transactions as short as possible. As I've hopefully demonstrated, the longer your transactions are, the more chance of blocking and the amount of locking that, that goes on. You want to keep all those durations as short as possible and access to those resources, reduce your complex logic, and hopefully you reduce an awful lot of your problems. I hopefully have been successful in demonstrating that recommitted snapshot isolation and snapshot isolation, whether it being on disk or even in memory, is the way to go. And I've, I've also explained to, to you guys my approach to troubleshooting queries. Um, there are some brilliant authors out there. So Grant Fritchie is, is one of them. He's written some great books on, on these, these topics. Um, you don't have to follow my approach, but please just make an informed judgment and follow an approach to troubleshooting your queries. But my one had definitely works for me. And I, in the demos that you will hopefully run, um, you've got one that uh, touches upon delayed durability and there's also an in-memory demo as well. Um, look at new technologies that will overcome some of these uh, resource bottlenecks because th there are lots of great things now in SQL Server that do improve performance substantially. And I talk about some of them there. And finally, always test your results in parallel, as you saw at the very beginning of this session, to prove consistency and, and speed, because it really, really does work. Thank you very much for sticking with me. If there are any questions, I think we've got a little bit of time to, to take them, and I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, yes, we have one question. OK. <laughs> um, do I, can I um, open up the Q&A or are you going to read it to me? Uh, I can read you. Okay. Oh, actually, I could probably, I could probably look at it here. Let's, let me drag this down. Can we get blocking queries from query store with weight stats data in SQL 2019 or the only way is with extended events? That is a very good question. Um, I can tell you that Benjamin talks about uh, lots more advanced ways to get um, get all this information than I could possibly hope to tell you. And the problem is, is my brain is so small that I can't remember uh, what he discussed now. So what I might have to do on that um and that question is 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 um, it come back to come back to you guys. I'll, I'll maybe I'll post a a little a little uh, blog post on on that. But there are there are lots of ways now to get even more information from SQL SQL twenty nineteen that I've not even touched upon. So sorry I can't answer that one. <laughs> so I I think that's the the last question or the only question. Um, if there are any more, please ask very quickly. Otherwise, I think we're done for today. <laughs>